All right. So then um, I really enjoy that, Griffin, because I feel like it, it does really tie together nicely what you're about to hear and what you have been hearing. Um, and so we'll kind of get into some of what, Griffin, you spoke of here. So I'd like to welcome up um, Jeff Kwan and Sean Viswesran to talk about an act. Are you going to go first? Yeah. Okay. Let's click you. Okay. Okay. How are you? It's good. <clears throat> okay. Um, so I will give you a little um, preview of what's going to be happening with Enact in the coming year. And we got some exciting things going on, moving from the technology to actually analytics. And uh, after that, Jeff will follow um, and he will talk a little bit about the data quality efforts that we're doing. And hopefully we'll have enough time after that to take uh, questions. So as Griffin just mentioned um, in this big picture view, um, Enact is sort of uh, one piece of this and it's a federated network. And uh, <clears throat> so this has been around for quite some time. I think it's almost like seven plus years at this point. And it connects um, all the CTSA sites and it's starting to expand beyond the CTSA sites. And basically it's a network which allows you to query interactively uh, structured EHR data to obtain counts. And that's the way it has been for a while. So I will just go through um, sort of two main new program features that will happen um, in year three of Enact, which starts uh, basically June, July and goes through next year. So I'll talk about data enclaves and uh, concierge clinical investigations. And I'll briefly mention about interoperability. So the data enclaves is uh, for mainly investigators when you need line level uh, patient data. And the concierge clinical investigations is a way to produce uh, evidence for clinical questions that uh, clinicians may have. So the key thing that uh, we are starting to do with uh, technology, especially in terms of uh, both the software, the I2B to Shrine, as well as the ontologies, is to enable uh, interoperability across the common data models. Um, so Enact and ACT started out basically with I2B2 as the main uh, data repository model. And uh, over time, um, what we have heard, um, both locally from our side as well as from all the other sites is that really it's a lot of work and energy to maintain multiple data marts with mul on multiple data models. So um, at this point, um, the ontology which is coming down the pike will be interoperable with OMOP. And there are actually several OMOP sites on the network at this point, uh, which are trialing out the new ontology. And so what this will enable is uh, to have both I2B2 nodes as well as OMOP nodes on the network. And uh, from the user perspective, it will be transparent. So the user really doesn't have to know whether the responding node is an I2B2 node or a OMOP node. And all the work is really done behind the scenes where the ontology um, will translate automatically to either the I2B2 node or to the OMOP node, along with the functionality that's there in uh, I2B2 and Shrine. So that's sort of the first step in making it interoperable beyond the I2B2 data model. And once we have that up and running, then in subsequent years, we'll look at the third big um, data model, the PicoNet uh, CDM. So data enclaves is something which uh, is uh, going to be piloted. It's actually in 
pilot at this point, and I'll give you some details about where we are uh, with data enclaves. So the key thing I would emphasize is that these are ephemeral data enclaves, and I'll talk a little about what it means to be ephemeral. Uh, but the, really the goal is to provide patient level data for research to investigators. So the, the data repositories that we have in the network have structured EHR data. Typically, these are limited data sets with timestamps. And the idea is to be able to pull together these uh, data from different sites to build cohorts on which research can be done. And more and more, we all know that uh, there's a huge demand now to do large scale real world data of which EHR is sort of the primary example to enable clinical and translational research. And we have multiple agencies, including CDC and the FDA, who want more and more to leverage um, real world data for various purposes. So the, the sort of the key characteristic in ENACT is that uh, these data enclaves will be both ephemeral and study specific. And the idea is that data set, which is created in the enclave, which will pull data from multiple sites, will be done in a study specific fashion. And it's ephemeral in the sense that uh, the idea basically is that once the main research question has been answered, then the data is sort of archived. And the reason to do it this way is to really de-risk the health systems um, and uh, also to have a lot more control over the data in the network. Um, so towards this, we are, uh, we are pretty much very close to having formed a data enclave team. And I'll go through a little bit of the details and pilots have begun. And the goal is that the lessons that we learn from these pilots will be then used to develop and implement data enclaves across the entire network. So right now it's being piloted at a few sites and I'll show you what's going on. So this is sort of the big picture view of how the uh, workflow is for the data enclaves. So uh, the first step uh, for a study, which is going to use data in an enclave, will still go through the standard uh, shrine um, tool where you identify the cohort across the various sites. And then after that, the sites which will participate in the study um, will move the data for that particular cohort from the sites to the ENACT hub. So the ENACT hub is going to be what we are going to call the enclave. Uh, and then the study investigators can perform their analysis in the ENACT hub. And uh, after the study is done, the data is then archived. So the Enclave environment is going to be an AWS platform. It has the usual kinds of uh, software like Python and R for analysis. And uh, essentially, you know, the study investigators will have to form um, a team science uh, team to actually be able to do the work because a lot of studies, as well as a lot of experience from networks like 4C here, uh, essentially inform us that you really need at least three kinds of capabilities. You need a data scientist, a statistician, and a clinical or a domain expert to be able to do um, good work with uh, EHR data. So in terms of uh, uh, some more details on how the data request workflow will happen, is that uh, we're going to have sort of two new sets of people, uh, the site data steward and the hub data uh, steward. So currently the way we are set up is that there's going to be four sites which are involved in the pilot. That includes Pitt, um, UCSD, um, UT Southwestern and Harvard. And uh, the AWS environment itself is um, maintained by UCSD at this point. But it really, it's not that UCSD actually has got control over the data that is providing the environment at this point. And the idea is that right now it is UCSD, which is uh, providing the 
uh, AWS platform, but eventually it could be any site which might want to uh, do this for the entire network. So it starts out, as I said, uh, with a query that runs through Shrine, which um, identifies the cohorts. And then there is going to be a site data steward at each site, which is participating in the study, uh, whose job will be to actually make sure that uh, the appropriate data, uh, which corresponds to that cohort, is then pulled out from the data repository and moved over to the AWS uh, uh, environment. And once it's moved there, then the UCSD team, uh, which has got a hub data steward, will take over the process, make sure that it's loaded appropriately, do some profiling of the data, creates the accounts, and uh, mm. uh, performs some basic data quality checks, and then provisions the accounts to the appropriate uh, investigators. And uh, at this point, we have done some testing. So the environment is up and running. Um, and I'll briefly run through the team in the next slide. And uh, we have also been able to access the environment from other institutions at this point. So this gives a little bit more details the, uh, in terms of the platform itself. As I mentioned, it's an AWS virtual private cloud. Um, it's got the NIST risk management framework methodologies for controlling the risk, uh, including standard security controls, and it's designed so that it can uh, scale up um, in simple ways. And the uh, UCSD team uses it locally, so they have pretty good uh, experience with this cloud. And uh, the idea is to also is to enable the use of pretty much uh, all the kinds of standard AI, ML, and statistical packages that are available in AWS services. So the Data Enclave team um, is uh, going to be, it is actually at this point in time, is, uh, is taken care of by Mike Hogart at UCSD. Um, and the site data stewards uh, are currently being identified at the uh, pilot sites. Uh, the hub data steward and the informatics staff are at UCSD and they're already being identified. So as I mentioned, the four sites are, uh, the pilot sites are Pitt, UCSD, Southwestern, and Harvard. Uh, we have a single IRB which has now been completed so that these four sites can participate in these pilot projects. Um, currently we have the DTA part of it in progress. So we'll be using limited data, essentially data which sits in the data repositories which are connected to the uh, Enact network. So the data just moves from there and those are limited data sets. And we have identified three projects which are the pilots which will be run but these are just starting projects. We are probably going to have more projects beyond this. Uh, the currently, just to sort of exercise the hub, um, mimic data is loaded into it, as, as well as I to B to synthetic data has been loaded into it. And there are some of the study investigators are already uh, sort of playing around with it. So I'll just run through the three pilot projects which have been approved. Um, the, the first one is uh, looking at uh, postpartum hemorrhage, looking at the prevalence incidence as well as the causes of postpartum hemorrhage. And this is an interesting one because the, it's actually an acute public health problem at this point because postpartum hemorrhage rates have actually been going up in the US for the past 10 plus years. And so, um, this project will look into uh, some of the incidents and the causes of postpartum hemorrhage. And uh, <clears throat> the other thing that we would like to do with this project is that the AHRQ actually does every 10 years, collects data from most inpatient uh, hospitals uh, to characterize postpartum hemorrhage. So this will be a good uh, example to see how the data from the Enact network compares to what uh, HRQ uh, does. So that's 
sort of one of the things that this project will do. And the second thing that this project is uh, will also do is that uh, the study investigators want to build some sort of a predictive model for postpartum hemorrhage. So the idea is that the model will be built with data from one site and then in um, see whether it generalizes to data from uh, other sites. So it's kind of sort of got two purposes. One is just to see how good the data is in the network for doing this kind of work. And the second is to actually build some predictive models. Uh, the second one is sort of a classical machine learning kind of a project. Um, so there's already been a model uh, for chronic kidney disease that predicts early progression to end-stage renal disease. So this is a model which is built out of VHR data. This has been built at Pitt by a group of uh, kidney investigators. And they would like to see how well uh, this generalizes. So they want to evaluate it on other institutions' data. So this pilot will basically look at taking an existing um, machine learning model and evaluating it on um, other sites' uh, data. And the third one is looking at uh, causal inference in medical records, especially with application to drug repurposing, repurposing for dementia prevention. So this is essentially looking at applying novel machine learning methods to observational data like EHR data. And uh, <clears throat> so with these three sort of examples, we are hoping to sort of excise a wide variety of uh, um, um, use cases that we would expect with uh, uh, row level EHR data. So the second one, uh, so the, the enclaves, the pilot is already on and we are hoping that uh, by the end of six months, uh, we will know where the pilots are and based on that, open it up to the entire network uh, after that. The second one is we are starting to work on this. So this will come after the data enclaves are up and running. So this is the concierge clinical investigations. And here the idea is to be able to use uh, real world data like EHR data for clinical questions. So the goal really, uh, out here is to provide evidence for clinical decision making, especially when uh, there is no high quality evidence available like from RCTs. And this is a sort of a well-known long-standing problem that a lot of the clinical decision making, really we don't have that great data. So, uh, and it has been shown that we can leverage EHR data to provide um, answers to some of these clinical questions. And these would be sort of the answers that wouldn't be a deep epidemiological study, but would just provide some evidence for clinical decision making. <laughs> and so this, for this, we're going to be creating, uh, again, a team somewhat similar to the team that we have for the data enclaves that will solicit questions from clinicians and then execute shrine-based inact queries. So the goal here is at least when we start out is to be able to do these queries with just the counts that you get out from shrine from the entire network and not have to look into patient level um, data. And so we will start piloting this in, the, in this fall. So the rough workflow that we think will happen is that clinical questions will come in. Uh, they'll be evaluated for feasibility in terms of whether you can actually answer it, it uh, this particular question with EHR data and especially just structured EHR data, which is what we have in the network at this point. And then you have to design uh, an appropriate study and execute the queries and then do the study and provide a report back to the clinician. So in this case, the team will consist of uh, a director again, uh, who will be a clinical champion who will solicit questions and lead the team. Um, it will also involve biostatisticians um, and informaticians. So the biostatisticians are in charge of sort of the study design, the informaticians uh, who do the phenotyping and the query design, and then also the analysts who execute the queries via Shrine. 
So we are in the process of identifying people uh, who will be doing these activities. I think we have probably have a few already identified, uh, but again, it's going to just involve the pilot sites, the same four pilot sites that we're going to draw uh, the members of this team from uh, to start off with. So we have done sort of a few prototype kind of questions. Um, and I'll give you a couple of examples in terms of how we have been approaching this. But these are sort of done with really uh, not having the team yet in place. So we don't have really great, say, biostatistical um, input in these things. And so our hope is that uh, we will actually do a much more refined version of these questions um, as we go down these uh, pilots. So one example that we looked at uh, was this particular question, um, is calf muscle injury associated with increased risk of deep vein thrombosis? And this is actually a real question which came up um, when uh, there was, uh, a, there is actually a very um, senior member of the INAC team uh, who had to go on a long haul flight you know, halfway across the world and uh, had a calf muscle injury before um, a few weeks before the flight. And the question came up, uh, is he at higher risk of deep vein thrombosis? And uh, when the primary care and when they look in the literature, there's really not much data um, around um, the risk uh, associated with calf muscle injury. So the basic idea was just to do a sort of a very simple retrospective cohort study where the exposure variable is no calf muscle injury. The outcome variable, we sort of looked at two outcome variables is uh, what's the risk of DVT, your life, lifetime risk of DVT after a calf muscle injury, as well as uh, what is the risk of DVT within 90 days, which is sort of a standard outcome you often see in these kind of medical questions. So the typical uh, Analysis pathway for this is coming up with reasonable phenotype definitions, uh, which essentially are in this particular case are ICD codes uh, for these two conditions, calf muscle injury and DVT. And then converting this into shrine queries. Uh, so in this particular case, we have, we had three queries which were run. Query one was, now looking at number of patients with calf muscle injury, query two is number of patients with calf muscle injury and develop DVT anytime after it. And then three is number of patients with calf muscle injury and develop DVT anytime after 90 days. And so uh, based on just running these uh, simple enough queries across the network, uh, this is, sort of the summary of what we found. Um, so based on uh, question number one was, what's the lifetime risk? And uh, uh, based on the counsel that they had, it's about 2.4%. And then a 90 day risk is a, it's much lower, it's 0.3%. Uh, and then we just pulled up in terms of what's the rate of uh, DVT in the general population, which doesn't necessarily have any kinds of calf muscle injury, and there's 0.07 person, and these are significantly different. Um, and so, based on this, actually, you know, the 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 primary care in this particular uh, case actually thought that you know either the person should be anticoagulated before they take this flight, or basically not take the flight at all. Um, now, this is very simplistic in terms of the statistical. Uh, design that it doesn't really take into account things like confounders and deeper analysis. But as it turns out, for clinical decision making, it was sufficient for the clinician to actually go ahead and uh, create an appropriate plan. So here is another example. And this one was uh, more uh, a proof of concept so we knew at the beginning of the pandemic, there was the question of whether hydroxychloroquine was an effective COVID uh, uh, medication. And in fact, the CDC, I think it was two years into the pandemic that the CDC did 
was it the series here? I don't know. But there was a pretty um, airtight study which was done and was published in the New England Journal of Medicine, which did show that you know, the hydroxychloroquine wasn't uh, effective for COVID-19. Uh, but the question that we asked was, could we have done this with data in, say, 2020, the first year of the pandemic, uh, using a retrospective cohort study? And the trick here was, you know, you really want to uh, take advantage of the fact that uh, hydroxychloroquine is used very commonly for rheumatoid arthritis. And so you can take advantage of that and develop this retrospective cohort study, which basically uses the exposure variable as people who have rheumatoid arthritis and have received hydroxychloroquine. And then the outcome variable is in this cohort, look at how many of them develop COVID-19 and sort of conduct this in 2020 and see whether you can get to some evidence which would uh, which took um, actually the CDC and other folks another year to actually uh, completely determine whether hydroxychloroquine was actually effective or not. So again, this comes down to developing appropriate uh, phenotypes. Um, and in this case, we took advantage of the fact that uh, the ACT ontology was modified very early in COVID to come up with reasonable definitions for COVID diagnosis. And that was really useful for this particular query. So in this case, uh, th there are four queries. Uh, query one is essentially looking at number of patients with rheumatoid arthritis in 2020 and not taking hydroxychloroquine. And then query two is extending query one and seeing how many of them develop COVID-19. And then query three is looking at patients, uh, rheumatoid arthritis patients, and taking hydroxychloroquine. And query four is extending that uh, to see how many of them develop COVID. So using this, just this four queries, you can then uh, compute these incident rates. So incidence of COVID-19 when not receiving hydroxychloroquine. And that comes to, um, when we ran this query on the network, 12.3%, uh, and incidence of COVID-19 when receiving hydroxychloroquine for the same uh, cohort of rheumatoid arthritis, and that came to 14.6%. Uh, and this is really, this is not statistically significant. So then we wanted to compare this with the randomized controlled trial, which was published in the New England Journal of Medicine. And there, uh, the study basically looked at um, people who received hydroxychloroquine and whether they developed you know, COVID within 14 days or not. And what they found was 11.8% uh, and 14.3%, and it's not statistically significant. So now given the kind of data we have, it's EHR data, and just taking advantage of this uh, natural experiment of hydroxychloroquine, um, we were able to demonstrate that we could have done this analysis in 20. Uh, 20 and get reasonable numbers, which was close to a randomized uh, control trial. So these are sort of the questions uh, that we would like to answer during this next pilot. Uh, we would take actually real questions coming from, you know, uh, from clinicians and uh, using um, essentially count data from the entire network to be able to answer these uh, kind of questions. And let's see what that. Yeah, I think uh, we'll, we'll take questions after Jeff is done. Thanks very much, Sean. And with, with all of that, you can see why quality of data is gonna be important for an act. So. 